Hello, my name is Brianna Love. I am a licensed paramedic here in the state of Alaska. I have uh, some experience on the North Slope with some cold injuries as well as avalanche areas down in the Matsu Valley. Today we're going to be talking about cold injury guidelines. You can find a majority of this information on the cold injury guidelines provided by the state of Alaska. We're also going to be covering some other environmental related emergencies and these can be used for wilderness EMTs, state of Alaska EMT 1, 2, 3, as well as different diving and swimming related programs. Tonight's topics are going to cover exposure to cold, where you're going to be able to differentiate between frostbite, not frost nip, hypothermia and severe hypothermia. We'll also be learning about treating some of those complications. We're going to cover exposure to heat, where you will learn the difference between heat cramps, heat exhaustion, and heat stroke, and the treatment considerations for those. With uh, water-related emergencies, you should be able to define by the end of this uh, course here, uh, different diving uh, definitions as well as the definition of drowning itself. So how the body loses heat. Uh, one of the ways that the body will lose the heat that we have is by conduction. Heat flows from a warmer material like our body to the cooler um, area surrounding it to be our environment. Convection occurs when air and water pass over the body, carrying away the heat. Radiation is sending out energy, such as heat in waves and into space. Evaporation, the change from a liquid into a gas. And our body perspires when it gets wet. You see evaporation. Um, you have people that are sweating outside in the cold, and you kind of see almost steam coming off of their head. We also lose a lot of heat out of our respirations. Um, when you feel your exhaled air, it's kind of moist and warm, and so you're actually losing water as well as heat when we exhale. Things that can increase heat loss would be your water chill and your wind chill. Water chill conducts heat away 25 times faster than the still air, and the wind chill caused by the convection from the body through the presence of the air currents. So the more the wind, the greater the heat loss. At 10 degrees with a 20 mile per hour wind, um, it would feel the same as if it was minus 25 degrees. This diagram here came right out of the Alaska Cold Injury Guidelines from 2014. As you can see, it kind of shows the different ranges and classifications from hypothermic down to severe hypothermia. So you can see a patient with mild hypothermia, they should be alert, normal or increased vital signs, some shivering. A patient who is alert and shivering may just be cold and hypothermic. A patient with moderate hypothermia may have a slow heart rate, slow respirations, decreased level of consciousness, their speech may be slurred, their gait may become unsteady or slow, shivering may be very vigorous until it becomes weak or absent. Once their core temperature reaches about 30 degrees Celsius or 86 degrees Fahrenheit, they start to lose the ability to be able to shiver to produce heat. A patient with severe hypothermia will have a marked decreased level of consciousness. They may have decreased or absent responses to any verbal or painful stimuli. So you can see on this graph here, this trend, as it goes from uh, ability to rewarm without external methods, and we're going to cover that with passive and active rewarming, how you can see it's good, limited, and then the inability to do that. Uh, the state wants us to remember the approximate core temperatures. So you can see 95 degrees Fahrenheit is our, is our pretty much baseline normal. 
um, until you get febrile when you're hitting 100 degrees or so. Uh, the 90 to 95 is going to be your mild. Uh, anything below 90 is going to be your moderate to severe, and it's more likely to have death once you get into the low severe. Defining generalized hypothermia is essentially the exposure to cold that reduces our body heat. It causes a state of low body temperature, specifically a low core temperature. Um, we don't have to have hypothermia with just our, our hands, limbs, and appendages getting cold. But when our core temperature drops below that 95 degrees Fahrenheit, it's considered uh, hypothermic. Some of the predisposing factors that can uh, increase the chances of hypothermia can be injuries, chronic illness, uh, geriatrics, and pediatrics. Some of the other predisposing factors besides your geriatrics and pediatrics um, could be the obvious and even the subtle exposure. So alcohol ingestion, a lot of people believe that drinking alcohol creates warmth and what it really is is you're cold so you start shunting blood supply from your limbs and when you drink alcohol it causes this vasodilation so that shunting is then reversed so all of that warm core blood is now being put back into the periphery so now your arms are feeling warm again although now there's more exposure that's going to allow cooling faster I want you guys to think about some of the changes that people go through from a young age to elderly. We start with uh, different skin surface areas and less fat in our children compared to those of adults. Some children have little to no ability to shiver and it's so mature that it doesn't really generate a whole lot of heat. Uh, children, babies, infants, um, and then those that are elderly and unable to, they may not be able to put clothing on independently or even take clothing off. As people age, we start getting failing body systems, different chronic illnesses, lack of exercise, and even certain medications can cause people to have the inability to maintain heat. Then you have all these other exposures of overdosing and poisoning that will affect somebody's ability to shiver or create heat. One of the assessments that you can get from basically across the room or from a distance is going to be their level of consciousness. Having them look up at you, that conscious alert and oriented, or out who. Um, then you can see if they're shivering. If you see figures shivering, you know that they're going to be a higher level of hypothermia, um, but not into the severe yet. If they're starting to get numbness, um, we can start considering that there's going to be trauma to digits and limbs. If they have a stiff or rigid, rigid posture, we think more of the severe end. Um, and then drowsiness, that's going to be our level of consciousness. We also want to assess their their breathing and their pulse, lack of motor coordination, that's that change in gait, joint and muscle stiffness if the joints are not getting that, that warm liquid oil to lubricate our joints, it's going to be harder for them to move. We also want to feel their core skin, so getting a temperature reading from like skin to skin on their, on their chest, abdomen, those type things to get an idea of how it's circulating through. You might not get a very good uh, SpO2 reading. It might be hard to get radial pulses because the core is going to be sucking all of that blood towards it. When you do get a temperature reading, you, there are certain thermometers that have different colors or different uh, abilities. So you want to use a thermometer that can reach into the 80s. A lot of the ones that you get uh, over the counter at the regular grocery stores, most of those read to about 90 and that's as far as they go. 
So anything above 90 degrees Fahrenheit is going to be mild or better. Anything below 90 degrees Fahrenheit is going to be severe. So that's kind of your magic number there. Anything, so 90, 98.6 is about 37 degrees Celsius. So that's that, that golden number that we all hear, that 98.6. And really anything above 95 is typically pretty normal to very mild. So we learned about heat loss, and we learned the different ranges of hypothermia. Now we have to treat our patient. First, we need to stop further heat loss. We can remove wet garments. We can get them out of the wind so we don't have to deal with the wind exposure. Um, we need to use passive external warming methods, as well as um, sometimes we have to do some more active. Do not allow the patient patient to sit or stand until they're warm. And that is mainly because we don't want them to fall down, get hurt, and now we have a trauma on top of this environmental um, emergency. And we talked a little bit about the patient's use of alcohol, and tobacco has very similar effects. It causes different um, vasoconstriction. We don't want to include any more activity that is going to mess with their heart rate, blood pressure, uh, we want to be able to control it with medications that we can control and not uh, over-the-counter type alcohol tobacco methods. Do not put them in the shower or bath. Again, these people might be losing their level of consciousness and we do not want them to drown. Uh, giving them food and oral fluids, unless they are really high on the, on the temperature, uh, they might not be able to protect their own airway. Um, don't ha do any rubbing of skin. We don't want to cause any friction. A lot of times um, exercise and walking can actually be harmful to feet and can uh, be dangerous for somebody that might lose consciousness. What we do want to do is give them some blankets, keep them in a horizontal position, maybe get some hot packs surrounding them. So passive versus active. Um, passive allows the body to rewarm itself. That's that covering with blankets. Active is going to be external heat source. So that is more warm IV fluids. We can do warm bath for his foot that you see there. So central, we can put hot packs in the, the chest, the armpits, the neck, the groin, all of those little pockets where a large amount of blood flows, and we can start warming the area that's surrounding it. Our extreme hypothermic patient, unconscious, no discernible vital signs, their heart rate can be as slow as 10 beats a minute, they are cold to the touch. These are your less than 90, closer to the 80 degree Fahrenheit patients. Um, try to avoid any rough handling. This can trigger uh, cardiac dysrhythmias. Um, they may be in a state of what they call like suspended animation or like a metabolic ice box. Um, they've been known to survive neurologically intact for a long period of time, even if there is little to no blood flow from the heart. We want to monitor temperature. We want to monitor their cardiac rhythm. If there is no pulse, we will need to start CPR, defibrillate as needed. If there is a pulse, care for them um, with little movement as possible as if you would any other response, unresponsive patient. So treating for any of our other um, unresponsives. Uh, there's an old adage out there, you're not dead until you're warm and dead. There are times, length of time or airway compromise that we will cover later that uh, is not necessarily included in that you're not dead until you're warm and dead because a lot of times like that this suspended animation can kind of prolong that neurological safety. Once you decide to do CPR you need to continue doing CPR. The only times you stop is when you are exhausted or there is a danger. Um, you do not have to start CPR is if there's other obvious fatal injuries, it's like decapitation. Um, if the victim is frozen, there's no ability to get air movement in and out. There's no ability to get chest movement. 
the victim is stiff, so compressions are impossible. You don't have to start CPR. The victim has been buried in avalanche for more than 35 minutes, and the airway is obstructed. There's not going to be any air movement. There could be complications with chest. Plus that more than 35 minutes, it's not a cold injury. We'll cover more of this in avalanche. It's more of an airway suffocation injury. And then, of course, withhold CPR for victims that have a, a DNR. This is the Alaska hypothermia algorithm right out of the Alaska cold injury guidelines. You can see there, it kind of gives you step by step. If they're conscious, what you do. If they're unconscious, what you do. Whether you can feel um, breathing, pulse, what you do. It kind of drives all the way down to the bottom where you continue them to the hospital or we end up terminating CPR. Localized cold injuries. Um, if you think about the blood that's being shunted, it's being shunted from ears, nose, face, hands, feet. People can live without these appendages or things that stick out on our body. So they're not necessarily life-saving organs. What, what the body wants to do is restrict the blood flow to be able to save the core, save the guts, save the heart, the lungs, the brain. So if it has to shunt all the blood into those areas, the blood that's been shunted now has no heat source. So you're going to see a lot more injuries to those appendages that don't have that heat source. You might see almost like a demarcation line. There's going to be a clear boundary that separates the injured and uninjured areas. With superficial or early, also known as a frost nip, there may be some freezing of the epidermal tissue, so that top layer. There may be some redness, um, followed by some blanching. They might have some diminished sensation, but the skin remains soft. You can easily rewarm, and as it does rewarm, it starts to tangle, um, and they can get some of that pins and needles sensation. They shouldn't have any permanent uh, like skin scarring or anything, or permanent neurologic damage. It can happen, but more than likely, it's just very superficial, hasn't gotten to the nerve tissue. Our late or deep is going to be our frostbite. There you can see swelling and blisters occur. It might have white and waxy skin. Uh, the object itself can be firm or frozen on a surface. The skin can be blotchy, mottled, even gray, yellow, or blue. We want to cover and immobilize uh, gently, we also want to provide some separation. You can see in the image here, they burned all their fingers, frostbit, and then we can put um, little spanners between their fingers. So there's going to be allowing of swelling and then covering so we can make sure that if those blisters do pop, they've got some sort of coating, there's protection over it, um, as well as keeping the hand warm. We're going to care localized injuries similar to the rest of the body if they're hypothermic. Uh, we remove them from that environment. We don't want the cold to continue. We need to rewarm the patient. We need to protect that area from further injury. They do have to go outside to get from one building to the other, from one vehicle to another. We need them to have gloves or warm boots or something to cover that area from any further cold. Uh, we want to splint it and cover the extremity so we can allow blood flow. We don't need things to be bent. We need it to have good, strong blood flow to keep rewarming. Do not rub or massage. This could actually damage the integrity of the skin that is surrounding it. Trench foot, uh, also known as immersion foot. It's, it can be similar to frostbite but it occurs in temperatures that is above freezing. So it's not um, icy, it's just long exposure to wet. Uh, there may be pain present. Uh, it could be, it could blister from spontaneous rewarming. Trench foot could also develop into uh, gangrene or other uh, infections. So we need to be very careful of um, opening up any of those blisters. 
uh, this isn't just walking outside into rivers, lakes, um, things like that. This can actually be some of our medical patients, person that has been in urine-soaked clothing uh, for a long period of time. Uh, it could be someone who lies on the floor undiscovered for several days in their home. So this idea of the skin breakdown from the water can happen uh, from, from a medical standpoint, as well as like a trauma standpoint, or out in the woods somewhere. Trench foot treatment, we need to recognize it early. Have that in your mind when you go and see the little old lady at the, at the home and see if that she's been getting diaper changes or anything. We need to make sure the area gets warm, dry, let airflow go around. Um, prevention is more effective, so making people change their socks if you're out hunting or camping in the woods, your feet get wet, take those socks off, put some new dried ones on. Prevention is way more effective than trying to treat it afterwards. Avoid any prolonged exposure standing in water. If you have a leaky boot when you're standing out there fishing and you can feel the water going in. Make sure that you come out often, allow your foot to dry out. It's not fun leaving the bank when people are catching fish, but it's better than having nasty trench foot afterwards. Um, remove wet socks, shoes, allow them to dry. There's all sorts of electric shoe dryers. Um, don't catch your shoes on fire, but you can always use a heat source, camping fire and stuff. Just dry those things out. Allow your, your feet to breathe. There may be pictures that come after this that some people might find a little graphic, but if we're gonna be an EMS, you gotta be able to handle some of this stuff. So we have a few injuries here. You can see some frostbite, some frost nip. Um, that ear, you can see a large blister. You see on the foot in the middle, You've got that waxy white skin, so that's going to be more of a frostbite. You can almost see like that demarcation line there at the base of the toes. Um, with that woman's face, you can see how the exposure of the nose, it's got that direct line. Um, some of these injuries, you might lose digits, level layers of skin, um, which can open up areas of additional infection. So some of our treatment considerations, where are we gonna pad? We gotta pad between the toes. We gotta be able to wrap the foot. We also have to have them walk out. If we're in a situation where they can't ride out, they might have to walk out. We need to protect that foot. So really, what are our treatment considerations? What are our locations? What are our resources that we may have? Um, have your teacher go over some of this stuff of how we're gonna be able to treat these. Depending on the size of the clinic, so this was done here, um, clinic here on the slope, our clinic can't handle a lot of these, especially the black toes at the bottom. This is something that's going to have to go and be surgically repaired, probably amputating. Um, we've got the, the hands at the top. That's going to need to have some sort of neurological physician look at. They need to be able to see if they can repair any nerve damage that might have happened. So this is going to be down through the different layers of skin. We do not want to be popping any of these blisters. We need to be able to pad and protect between the fingers. So you can see that defined line right there on the fingers of what was exposed and what was covered. State of Alaska lines out the Alaska frostbite algorithm. This was taken again from the Alaska Injuries Guidelines 2014. We can treat pre-hospital or do they need to go to the emergency department? Uh, it talks about hypothermia and then going to the hypothermia guideline. You want to treat at home, treat in the ambulance, or if they need to be hospitalized with Amputation, wound care, different IV medications, pharmacology. It really depends on the location and how significant these uh, frostbite burns can be. Exposure to heat. No, we do not live in Arizona. 
I don't think I can handle 126 degrees outside, but we can still have heat exposure problems. Hyperthermia is just high body temperature, specifically core temperature. A fever is the elevation of body temperature above normal for a person. The magic number is going to be our 98.6 or 37 degrees Celsius. Some of the effects of heat on our body, um, it can develop the heat cramps, which are muscle cramps from overexertion and dehydration. We can develop exhaustion, um, acute illness with like nausea, vomiting. Um, if it goes unchecked, it can actually lead to heat stroke which would cause death or um, stroke-like symptoms. And uh, those are more indicative of your hot, dry, and probably not so moist skin. So this slide here, you can see the difference between your heat exhaustion and your heat stroke. Um, with the heat exhaustion, you're going to be trying to cool the body down. Your body is going to react by pushing out fluid to to cool the body down, but it's also going to be wanting more fluid. So you get that heavy thirst, um, that heavy breathing. Remember, we lose water when we breathe. So you're going to be breathing faster to try to get rid of that heat and that water, which in turn is going to dehydrate you. So it's kind of a twofold. The body's going to be producing water to cool it down, but if we don't replenish the water, it's going to lose that ability to cool the own, its own self down. Um, with the heat exhaustion, there may be changes in their mentation. They can start getting clumsy, confused, a little dizzy. They'll still have some of those heat cramps, uh, especially as they get more dehydrated. And with the heat stroke, as the skin temperature increases, um, they start having some flushing, that hot, dry skin. They're no longer able to use the water in our body. They're kind of drying out. Um, so there's no fluid in our lungs, they start to have difficulty breathing, we're not respirating the same, um, their behavior becomes more bizarre, more altered, they're more confused, they can actually go into seizures and uh, even uh, stroke. Some predisposing factors, heart disease, um, dehydration already, people that don't really like the taste of water or they drink a lot of sugary drinks. Um, obesity uh, can decrease the ability to uh, keep oneself from overheating. Infections and fevers, so now their, their body is fighting off something and it's increasing their internal temperature. And then you get them into a hot environment. Now you're creating heat on the outside as well as on the inside. Uh, diabetes, they might not have the ability to be able to um, sense certain temperatures or uh, their thermal regulator on the, on the inside of their body is not acting appropriately. Different drugs and medications, um, whether it is medications that they're taking um, or interactions with like street drugs, like cocaine can definitely increase your body temperature. It's going to increase the metabolic rate of your body. It's going to increase your heart rate, your blood pressure. It's going to make things go faster. It can dry you out. And then just like our cold injuries, age can definitely affect. So poor thermal regulation, it's not developed in children. Um, kids can't remove their own clothes or the elderly patients are not able to remove their own clothes to be able to uh, maintain uh, that temperature uh, or they're old and they don't really sense that heat level they don't feel hot to them could have an interference with any prescribed medications they might have the inability to escape heat if they are in a house that they are kind of bed bound they're not able to get out of the heat um, many times people will put multiple layers on grandma, grandpa, or their children, and those multiple layers compound the fact of the heat around them. Or lack of an air-conditioned environment. Not everybody, especially here in Alaska, we don't have AC in a lot of places. 
you open a window, you open a window on the other side of the house, and you got that cross freeze. We're finding now with some of our hotter summers that we might start having to invest in some AC. This here is a pretty sad topic. Um, as I'm recording this, there was just recently a death in, uh, in Hatch Pass of a young 17-year-old. Uh, These are very unfortunate. They happen real quick. They happen to young, healthy people. And, uh, most of the deaths are actually caused by asphyxiation and not necessarily the trauma. There is some trauma involved, but most of the death is not due to the trauma. Uh, many avalanche vic victims, um, they can get hypothermic, but it's very rare for them to uh, still be alive, get hypothermia, and then die. So below 35 minutes, they're usually not hypothermic. Most people that are out in the snow or in areas of avalanches, they got their snow pants on, their snow jackets on, uh, so they're less likely to get cold. But over 35 minutes, if they haven't succumbed to asphyxiation, they're more likely to be hypothermic. So when we talked earlier about withholding CPR, this is where that number comes into play. Because after 35 minutes, you're not treating them for hypothermia. You're treating them for the asphyxia. But they have been without oxygen in a sudden environment for over 35 minutes. Yeah, with this, prevention is key. Knowing how to read the mountains, knowing how to gauge whether the different layers of snow is going to be safe, uh, wearing beacons, going in groups so they can keep an eye on where you're going to be at. The, the belief is horizontal slope of survival is between 35 and 90 minutes. Um, and a low risk of, of dying. So being able to find them still alive using the poles, using beacons, that's the best way. Uh, people have described that they've been stuck in an air pocket, and so it can happen uh, that people are able to be found an hour later. Alaska Cold Injury Guidelines 2014 also has an algorithm for Alaska avalanches. So it goes through whether the patient is conscious, alert, responsive, how long they've been down, is their airway open, are you able to start CPR, do they require CPR, getting um, electricity to them, and transporting to the hospital. Working up here on the north slope, we have extreme temperatures, negative 40, negative 60. Um, just because the temperatures are cold, you can still get overheated. There have been cases of polar bears collapsing from heat exhaustion in normal temperatures of 20 degrees below zero, 15 degrees below zero. So sometimes it's even our Arctic gear or the activities that we're doing that can cause heat exhaustion. So this typical face here, this guy's probably got a balaclava on, an Arctic coat, he's got his goggles, he's probably got long underwear on, and depending on how much work he's doing and how much intake of water, he can start developing dehydration and then heat exhaustion. Heat exhaustion, just like our cold injuries, remove them from the environment. Stop the further injury. Uh, giving them oxygen to be able to help that respirations, um, have to work less. We're going to loosen or remove clothing. We don't want anything tight fitting. We want air to be able to move between layers. Keep them, keep them flat. Don't allow them to walk around. Keep their mentation good. Um, you can give them small sips of water. Large gulps of water can actually make them throw up and we don't want them throwing up. We want them to maintain their water. Our heat stroke patients are not able to drink water to increase their fluid to be able to sweat. These people need some active cooling. So we need to, again, remove them from that hot environment, yeah. remove the clothing. We're going to apply cold packs, cold packs to the neck, groin, armpits, 
give them that oxygen, help with their breathing, and we're going to transport immediately. You can see it here. They've got um, this patient basically just covered in ice uh, to try to cool things down. Don't put them in an ice bath. If you put them in water, they could easily drown with their changes in mentation. We'll cover some water-related emergencies. Types of accidents occurring on or near water here in Alaska. We do boating, water skiing, windsurfing, jet skiing, diving. There's even some scuba diving here in Alaska. Drowning. It often uh, occurs when a person str struggles to try to keep above water. Um, they try to take that last deep breath in, and when the water enters the mouth, um, it goes into the pharynx, the stomach, the body will actually have a spasm. There will be a reflex swallow. They'll, they might have some gastric distension, some vomiting. They could have some aspiration. Um, the water may enter the airway. Um, there's going to be more swallowing, invol involuntary, involuntary swallowing of even more water. Um, all incidents are referred to as drowning. You notice here that there is no near drowning. Uh, near drowning is not used because there was a confusion regarding the terms of drowning and near drowning. Anytime there is copious amounts of water entering uh, the airway, it is considered a drowning. Uh, the four phases of cold water immersion is your cold shock response, um, the cold incapacitation or the failure to swim, um, hypothermia, and then the, the post-immersion collapse. So they've actually found that people that are being rescued, they kind of have that, that rescue reflex. Where they're like, finally, I have somebody here to help me, and they kind of just give up. Their body stops at that moment, and then they drown. So they've made it this whole time, floating, treading water, surviving. Rescuers show up, and then the patient drowns. Here are some of the uh, mechanisms that cause uh, people to drown. Some people that drown actually die just from the lack of air. It could trigger a um, laryngospasm. It could seal off the airway. Unconsciousness is actually from the hypoxia. Um, but again, what I was talking about, that, that last breath or that reflex, is the, uh, the final attempt to get air into the lungs, and that's when water comes in. Um, so dry drowning versus wet drowning, um, a significant amount of water doesn't have to enter the lungs. Uh, it's that laryngospasm. It blocks off the water from entering, but it also blocks off any air from entering. The wet drowning, there is no spasm to completely occlude the airway, and enough water gets in that there is no room for air to enter the lungs. Number one related uh, factor to drowning here in Alaska is the use of alcohol and then the inability to swim. Uh, people that have not taken any swimming lessons or are unable to swim have no way to be able to tread water and get their head above water. Um, other predisposing factors, swimming in areas where there's no lifeguard, swimming in areas that are unprotected, there's no monitoring, and not following any posted warning signs. Um, there's certain beaches, there's certain inlets that people should not go out to, they're unsafe, any areas where there's a increased undertow to drag people out into the ocean and then they're unable to get back into the into the land. Factors that affect the ability to survive um, a drowning, really the cleanliness of the water. How much grossness and gunk are you getting into your lungs and into your body? Uh, the difference between fresh water and salt water, the length of time that they're under the water, the age and the health of the victim, if they have other health concerns, whether that will make it detrimental to them. Children actually have a longer survival time and a greater chance of surviving resuscitation. Um, we, they don't have nearly as many uh, cardiac lung defects that we have as adults with our cheeseburgers and everything else that we've been eating and smoking and bonfires. Uh, and really like the, the temperature of water. So children 
drowning in cold water under 68 degrees have actually been found to be able to be resuscitated without any neurological defect more often than adults. Not all drowning in, in water is going to be the same. There's actually a difference between the freshwater drowning and the saltwater drowning. So freshwater, it diffuses across our alveoli, um, the blood gets diluted, our uh, ability to carry oxygen gets decreased, there's going to be some um, lung inflammation that develops and some of the surfactant is destroyed. You can get vin uh, ventricular fibrillation or V-fib uh, from a freshwater drowning. If we can get the water out, get it kind of cleared out, they can get home from the hospital fairly um, mild treatment. Salt water is actually three to four times more hypertonic than what's in our body. So it's that salt, it's going to actually want the body to produce water to dilute it down. So if the salt is in our lungs, the water is going to come from somewhere and get into our our lungs. That is where the pulmonary edema is going to develop. So after drowning in the ocean, someone coughs up stuff, says that they're fine, and then hours later they end up drowning from the pulmonary edema that comes in. Their blood volume decreases because all of that fluid's coming from the bloodstream and hitting the lungs. So now they're shocky and they can't breathe. Drowning treatment. Uh, Primary concern is going to be safety. If you can't swim, don't go out there. If you are not a trained lifeguard, do not go out there. If you're not part of the dive team, do not go out there. Um, assume anybody that is unconscious and responsive in water is going to have some sort of spinal injury. Uh, even though the, it may be an airway problem, we still want to make sure that we protect from any further heat loss. Because remember, we were talking about that wind chill and water chill. This water being 68 degrees or colder, it's going to be decreasing their body temperature 25 times faster. We need to assess the airway breathing circulation, uh, start CPR, defibrillate. Uh, there may be some airway resistance. If you can pour water out from the side, there's lots of videos of people actually pouring quite a bit out. So in between compressions, kind of dump stuff out, be able to get some more um, air into their system with bagging. Uh, do not delay transport. These people need to be treated at the hospital because there's more of an issue with their airway and their lungs than we can treat just doing CPR. Uh, avoid laying the patient on a cold surface because they've already lost a lot of body temperature. We don't want to continue uh, losing it through conduction. Want to remove all wet clothing and cover the body with dry, warm linen. Here's the algorithm for cold water drowning from the uh, the guidelines. So you can see there, it's got different steps of whether they're conscious alert, the temperature of the water, if they're breathing, if they're not breathing, um, doing CPR and transporting. Assessment of some dive emergencies. Um, most of them involve head, neck, um, basically diving, going head first into things. It could also involve the spine, hands, feet, or the ribs, depending on waves hitting them, um, the turbulence of the water. Uh, things that can affect it could be the breathing apparatus that was used, the suit that was worn, whether it's a wetsuit or a dry suit. Um, other effects could be from the depth, how many dives they've taken, the duration of dives, the rate of ascent, how experienced the diver may be. Um, this, you, we can even get patients that did some diving and then they flew somewhere and now we're seeing them. Um, we also need to ask about medication and alcohol use, any medical history and any previous events uh, similar to this. Otherwise, you treat them as you would for any other accident out of water. So we're going to talk about some definitions of um, trauma that's related to dive injuries. So bare trauma is any injuries caused by changes in pressure. You can have the squeeze, which is injury to the inner earlobe or the inner ear. 
Uh, signs and symptoms could be middle ear pain, ringing in the ears, dizziness, some hearing loss, and in some severe cases, rupture of the eardrum. Nitrogen narcosis, also known as ruptures of the deep. Um, basically, the breathing is compressed under the air pressure. They start getting too much nitrogen. Uh, it becomes toxic to their like, brain function. They can appear intoxicated and may take some very unnecessary risks, so doing harmful things while they're underwater. Um, any panic will worsen their situation. They may be disoriented, confused. Um, they may not know how to get up, so underwater, being confused, they may not know which way is up or that they are low on oxygen. Um, the bends is rapid reduction of air pressure while um, ascending. So dives below 33, 33 feet require a saged ascent to prevent the bends. Um, dissolved nitrogen does not leave the blood. Nitrogen bubbles form, especially in the abdomen and in the joints. It obstructs uh, blood vessels and it causes severe pain. So you'll see them bent over, abdominal cramping. All three of these is considered barotrauma. So they're all related to pressure and trauma related to diving injuries. Other scuba diving related injuries could be pulmonary overpressure. It can occur in deep or even shallow as low as three feet. Um, it is when the breath is held during the ascent. So they're coming up, the air is compressed, and as they come up, it starts to uh, expand and they will actually rupture alveoli if they don't exhale. Uh, an air embolism may enter the circulatory system from this damaged lung, and they may need to have a needle decompression of their chest. Uh, they'll have a collapsed lung or a popped lung. So if you get somebody out of the water with difficulty breathing, and you listen to lung sounds, and you only have lung sounds on one side, we can start um, considering it the uh, arterial gas embolism, they held their breath while they were uh, ascending. Decompression sickness, the diver um, goes to the surface um, too quickly from a prolonged dive. It basically takes 148 hours uh, to appear, just mentation in their head will change. Water rescue, when I was talking about safety is number one, you don't want to go out into the water unless you've been trained or it's a last resort. So remember, reach, throw, row, and go. Always um, send something out there to them first. So grab a stick, drag them in. Throw a rope, drag them in. If you have to take a boat out there, just be aware that they could tip the boat and now you're both in the water. And if you do have to go swim out there, uh, there are a lot of techniques and I advise people to get some training before they go and risk their life to swim out to a patient. Ice rescue, always assume that you can fall in. Um, throw that reach, row, reach, throw, row and go. Um, you can throw a flotation device out to the patient and drag them in. You can push out a boat, so if you do fall, fall through the ice, you're in some sort of um, device that floats. Plus, it also um, pushes out, it distributes the weight, uh, similar to a ladder on the next option there. You stand on it, and then your weight is out throughout several feet. Uh, when you do get them out of the ice, you're going to treat for hypothermia, and you're going to transport. This is a near drowning, this is a cold injury, um, it could be trauma, there is a lot involved with ice rescue. This here is a really sad video of a child drowning. Not everybody has to watch it, you can look away. Um, people ignored this child as he struggled and struggled and struggled and eventually became lifeless in the pool. He had floated around and people were kind of avoiding him. So there is this mentality that people don't want to be involved. It is kind of a bad video to watch. So we'll allow the instructor to decide on watching that or not. 
questions to consider at the end of this chapter. How's your safety? Can you enter safely in this heat or cold environment? Can you get to the patient safely? Can you get them out safely? Um, looking at the patient from a distance, can you tell if they've got an altered level of consciousness? Are they able to follow commands? Do they look like they are confused, abnormal gait? Uh, with hyperthermia, are they, is their skin hot to the touch? Are they able to sweat? Are they able to cool themselves down? So you and your family are at a local lake. There is a boat in the middle of the lake. It's capsized. You can hear screams um, from the scene. You can kind of swim. Several other people begin swimming out to the site. What are some concepts learned in the scene size up? What are your safety concerns? What are some of the options of rescuing people? Hope you enjoyed this presentation on cold injury, hot injury guidelines for the state of Alaska. Uh, we definitely have some significant weather changes. We've got some interesting people wearing interesting clothes in Alaska. Um, I was definitely that teenager that wore t-shirt and jeans and my coat was stuffed in my backpack. Uh, so we need to be mindful that everybody's a little bit different. Um, everybody takes different drugs, vitamins, different medications, um, treat the life threats uh, immediately, watch the mentation of people, how they're going to react. It can determine a lot with your injuries, whether they're mentating or they're not, can mean the difference between passive and active rewarming. I want to say thank you. I got majority of the images from searching Bing. Um, Brady Books offered information and then as well as State of Alaska Cold Injury Guidelines. Thank you.